screen. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to Labor and Compensation and Collaborative OER Creation, the American Yacht as Case Study. I'm Cynthia Henry, and I will be the be moderating this session. I am uh, adding the links to various support services offered by the conference, as well as the link to the code of conduct that's in the chat, um, which is in effect for all conference events. And now I'll hand it over to the presenters. Let me stop sharing and y'all can share. Great. Howdy, folks. Uh, my name is Ben Wright. I'm an associate professor of history at the University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, I'm joined by my co-editor of the American Yop, Joe Locke, who is an associate professor at the University of Houston at Victoria. Uh, we're really grateful for you all being here and really for the chance to kind of reflect uh, on our OER project. In fact, it's about 10 years, almost to the month, I think, to the first uh, informal conversations that Joe and I had about this project. So uh, it's a nice moment to kind of look back at this project that we've we've produced, um, as well as kind of think about where we're going to go from here. Um, so a couple of things uh, right away. Uh, first of all, we we you know have a, a kind of traditional presentation and we'll have times uh, time for question and answer. But we really do encourage folks to use the chat function. Uh, anytime a question pops into your head, throw it in the chat. Uh, there's two of us will be kind of taking turns speaking and the other one will keep an eye um, on that conversation. Uh, we're interested in answering any questions that come up for you. Frankly, we're also interested in your thoughts. Uh, feel free to chime in with comments, uh, snide remarks, you know, outrage, whatever, whatever uh, is coming to your head. We we are thinking about this presentation both as a way of kind of thinking through where we've been, uh, as well as uh, thinking about where we're going to go. And particularly towards the end, um, uh, we we welcome feedback on on thoughts of of kind of uh, of, of of what we're up to. So uh, with that, I'll kind of start by saying that this project or this presentation, we really have three goals of what we want to get done today. Uh, first thing we're going to do is we are historians, so we have to historicize. We're going to briefly give you an overview of the history of open educational resources. Uh, and as we do so, we want to keep an eye uh, on questions of political economy, getting at our kind of core question here of labor and compensation. Um, as historians, we think that, you know, knowing where we came from is really important uh, in making meaning of, of the world today. And that is true for open educational resources uh, as it is with kind of everything else. So we're going to start uh, by giving you kind of an overview of how we got here uh, in terms of uh, OER. Second, we're going to describe uh, the process, perhaps exploitative process, that led us to create our project, uh, The American Yop, uh, a massively collaborative open United States history textbook. Okay, so we'll historicize, then we'll give you uh, our own history in a way, talk about our project, uh, what it is, and, and how we went about creating it. Uh, and then finally, uh, we want to think about compensation models. Uh, frankly, we hadn't didn't have one at the beginning. Uh, we feel like it's probably essential for us to have one now uh, as we move forward. So we'll talk about what's next for the project, but along along with that, some kind of reflections uh, about the economics uh, of OER um, and how we're thinking through these issues. So again, jump in the chat with any thoughts, and with that, I'm going to let Joe give us some history. All right. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. Welcome, everybody. Thanks again for having us. Um, it's really nice that this conference has been organized and, uh, you know, looking at the program and everything is just fantastic. That this kind of energy is taken off in the state. Um, yeah, as Ben mentioned, we are historians, so uh, we're still kind of tied to these kind of traditional um, uh, presentations. You know, I have some text that I'll be reading a little bit of. But as Ben said, please, you know, jump into the chat. Uh, please feel free to push back about any of this. We really do want this to be as much as possible a conversation. Um, but to get started, yeah, as Ben said, we wanted to kind of root uh, our experiences producing the American YAP in this kind of broader um, history of digital history of OER and some of the early developments in kind of hacker culture and computing. So as Ben said, we launched the beta edition of the American YAP in the fall of 2014, and we had been thinking about it and preparing it for the previous 18 months before that launch. Um, that rose out of more immediate concerns about practical concerns about our class, our students, uh, the kind of very uh, unique uh, 
uh, positioning of OER within history and kind of what we saw as a need. But what we were doing was also rooted in this much longer history of open source cooperative work uh, and the long history of digital computing. Uh, we did write about this recently in an article on the American Historical Review that's called uh, History Can Be Open Source, Democratic Dreams and the Rise of Digital History. Uh, that's free to read, though not open, actually, uh, on the AHR's website. Uh, we should probably like, throw a link for anybody that's interested, and maybe we'll do that at the end. Um, but for our purposes here, uh, framing our conception and execution of the op, uh, doing that within the broader histories of humanistic computing, digital humanities, OER, we think can contextualize some of the strategies we use in the construction of the American YAP uh, when we first launched this project. Um, so trends associated with open access, the open access movement, things like decentralized collaboration, anti-corporate cultural identity, extra institutional status, these were all apparent in the earliest years of computer programming. Right. As far back as the 1950s, uh, volunteer programmers working with IBM machines worked together uh, outside of kind of formal direction or organizational oversight. And they established and spread a free library of operating systems that culminated in the release of the share operating system, uh, operating system in 1959. So this kind of cooperative energy is really, you know, at this stage, uh, a couple of generations old. Uh, that same cooperative energy flowed through the following decades. It drove a lot. I drove a lot of the rise of computing culture in the following decades, uh, leading into uh, the kind of rise of digital humanities and for us more specifically digital history. Um, and part of that accelerated, you know, we would see this in our field uh, with the opening uh, of the widespread adoption of personal computing in the 1990s. Uh, but these kind of open and information uh, informal networks like Share, they flourished among programmers long before that. And so that ideological commitment to openness that emerged from uh, software engineers, hacker culture, all of that, that was made um, very explicit by the 1980s. It had been kind of, it, it was an idea that had, had been present for a while and was made quite explicit. Um, often this is traced to activists like Richard Stallman, who, who for example, formed uh, the GNU project in 1983, and then two years later launched the Free Software Foundation, helping to codify this kind of copyleft style of collaborative, modifiable software engineering. Uh, he wrote in a manifesto that same year that he wanted to use computers without dishonor and contribute to a quote, post-scarcity world where nobody will have to work very hard just to make a living. So, I mean, that's very drastically utopian, um, but that use development of free and open materials, it was always framed as a public good, right? Stallman's manifesto set this bar that was difficult to reach. Uh, he interpreted openness as this essential step toward this kind of broad and participatory form of social justice among software engineering. Um, and uh, later manifestations of open access advocacy would fall uh, kind of often more narrowly focused on that idea of cost alone. But in this world, that uh, moral idealism was kind of undergirding a lot of the uh, rise of kind of the open access movement. Um, nevertheless, despite this kind of like moral understanding of, of this kind of work, uh, the political economy of higher education did steer the development and distribution of OER. Uh, financial and institutional support flowed through the same well-worn channels of academia that it always had. Um, the early OER movement in universities relied upon university systems and traditional academic funding sources. So for instance, in 1997, uh, the California State University System launched uh, Merlot, the Multimedia Education Resource for Learning and Online Teaching. That was a kind of shared repository for uh, creating and distributing free online teaching resources. Uh, it drew inspiration from the National Science Foundation project, um, authoring tools in an educational object economy. And doing so, it kind of spread, it won the buy-in of other university systems, uh, the University of Georgia, the UNC system, the Oklahoma State system. And by 2000, there were over you know, 23 subscribing institutions. It became a really early important repository for free and open uh, materials. In fact, it, you know, it is still a relatively important institution. And uh, more than anything though, for us, it testified to the kind of the advances and the production of OER uh, and the distribution of OER within university systems. And that was also at this moment where a lot of uh, foundation funding and grant funding kind of poured into the digital humanities in the interest of, or in universities more broadly in the interest of OER development. So for instance, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, that's been huge in the history of OER, right? In 2001, they made a grant to MIT in support of its open courseware initiative. Uh, MIT president, when he was kind of describing that, 
Um, he tried to tie this kind of relationship between programmer culture and OER, and he put this in the New York Times. He said, we tried to open up software infrastructure in a variety of ways, and that's what's unleashed the creativity of software developments or developers. I think the same thing can happen in education, right? So the idea is that this kind of like Silicon Valley OER utopianism could flow easily into universities and other institutions follow that lead. Uh, Utah State University drew on Hewlett funds to um, create the Open Learning Support Initiative. Carnegie Mellon went even further, uh, trying to create a full online learning experience, the Open Learning uh, Initiative. And by 2005, the Hewlett Foundation had financed the creation of the Open Courseware Consortium that uh, was this kind of uh, international um, collection of member institutions. So universities and grant making organizations, they had begun to buy into open learning, uh, open learning by the beginning of the 21st century, but the question's why, right? Advocates most obviously and prominently made a moral case for this. Um, three scholars of digital publishing recently wrote that open access was born from a technological utopian vision to make traditional research output available to everyone. And you see this in the rhetoric that surrounded the rise of OER, right? The 2002 Budapest Open Access Initiative attempted to codify that vision and offer guidance for OER producers. It said, an old tradition and a new technology have converged to make possible an unprecedented public good. Academic research, this kind of older tradition, uh, and widespread internet access, this new technology, could make the intellectual fruits of academic labor available to all. Open access would kind of be the clarion call for connecting those two things. And if research could be available for all, why not educational materials? So five months after the Budapest Declaration, the UNESCO sponsored Forum on the Impact of Open Courseware for Higher Education in Developing Countries uh, met to discuss possible avenues for advancing this and declared um, quote, their satisfaction and their wish to develop together a universal educational resource available for the whole of humanity to be referred to henceforth as open educational resources. The forum further hoped that this open resource for the future mobilizes the whole of the worldwide community of educators. Of course, it's important to understand that open does have a distinct meaning. Uh, this is something, of course, that uh, academics, you know, historians often uh, kind of take for granted and then and now still kind of have trouble distinguishing between material that's just available freely on the Internet, uh, rather than with that kind of broader uh, OER world of allowing for modification and redistribution and remixing and things like that. Um, right. OER is not only free, it's adaptable. Um, and it allows that kind of freedom that early software engineers had kind of um, developed. Uh, nevertheless, OER was real quick to take hold in disciplines uh, outside for us, the humanities. It was more often seen in disciplines related to science and technology. Right by 2001, uh, the Public Library of Science pioneered the model of an open access journal. Uh, MIT, who had created the Open Courseware Consortium, created uh, this kind of new pressure for institutions with similar strengths to follow. Uh, and in 2004, Rice University engineering professor officially launched Connections. Uh, this was an open resource sharing platform that links resources across a lot of different campuses. And that early investment by Rice University uh, combined with uh, Grant uh, uh, Gates Foundation money, and that helped uh, Rice launch OpenStax in 2012, which has probably become the kind of central platform for entry-level university textbooks maybe that um, uh, people are familiar with. And so open access, it, it thrived in the sciences for many years, with, uh, but it was still a relatively new idea in the humanities, right? So more than a decade after much of this had happened, um, two prominent historians, Joe Gouldy and David Armitage, uh, published in 2014, I believe with uh, Cambridge University Press, this open monograph, the History Manifesto, which for our discipline was a big deal. We hadn't really seen academics uh, publishing open access monographs like that, that were kind of just published digitally and open uh, with open access. And it, when they wrote that, uh, their preface, they said even two or three years ago, referring to you know, 2012, 2011, they said most academics in the humanities and certainly most members of the non-academic public had not heard much of anything about the open access movement. But already as um, open access advocate Martin Weller put it, he said openness by then is such a part of everyday life that it seems unworthy of comment. Publications in the humanities were following the sciences into open access publishing, and more importantly, grant money was really flowing into open projects over the last 10 years. In fact, uh, as Eve put it, he said, it's now more often the practicalities of achieving such a goal that are the focus of disagreement. And of course, it's where that those practicalities were really where um, open textbooks had stalled, and certainly uh, in 
uh, the field of history, right? So the primary push for the adoption of these was relatively obvious. The cost of higher education had exploded uh, over the previous decades. And academics suddenly had to confront this very ugly fact that not only through textbooks, but through tuition, through um, uh, uh, enrollment policies, who gets accepted, who doesn't, who's able to attend, who doesn't, who goes into debt, who doesn't, um, that academic institutions often are perpetuating and accelerating inequality instead of combating it, which is often the kind of rhetoric that you find around higher education, right? Income achievement gaps, for instance, weren't shrinking, they were growing. Um, and if higher education is already rife with these kind of seemingly intractable inequalities, then this utopian rhetoric of digital disruptors um, while certainly appealing, it really didn't quite get at the roots of what was increasingly becoming, as critics would call it, like a neoliberal university, um, it, let alone these kind of bigger structural inequalities of 21st century capitalism, right? So for us, you know, textbooks were certainly just one small component of a broader and more complicated problem, but it was certainly a problem that as we kind of were coming out of grad school was a very keenly felt one. Uh, when we started our project, there really wasn't a high quality OER textbook in American history. Um, the U.S. History Surveys, it's, it's usually taught in two sequences. I mean, it's one of the most commonly caught, uh, taught courses in uh, the United States. Um, and when we kind of began teaching these courses in the 2010s, right, the textbook crisis seemed like it was at its peak. We were teaching in the shadow of the Great Recession. And yet again, there really wasn't a good OER option available to us. Um, up the road from me at the University of Houston, uh, Sarah Mintz and Stephen, uh, Stephen Mintz and Sarah McNeil had published uh, Digital History, which was like one of these really great field defining projects, one of the first kind of stabs at a digital textbook. Um, and it was still around in the early 2010s, although it's kind of dedication to a hyperlink history was getting already kind of a little bit rough by then. Um, and we were looking for something that, you know, did have this kind of open access uh, ability of people to kind of use it and reuse it and mix it in ways. Uh, OpenStax was just getting launched, but they hadn't had a history textbook yet. And so when we started um, teaching these surveys, trying to find a resource like this for our students, we kind of rather naively thought we would just go ahead and launch our own. And so that kind of takes us into when we started conceiving the op. and I'll hand it over uh, to Ben for him to kind of carry on there. Sure. So uh, I, I do want to talk about how we came to our project um, of the American Yop. And first of all, I'll say that as I'm doing that, uh, if you all got your phone in your hands, you might want to go to AmericanYop.com. You can actually see uh, what the textbook looks like now, um, give, you, give you a sense of that. Um, uh, and also, thank you to Cynthia Henry for, for dropping things in the chat. I really do appreciate that. And I also just want to acknowledge Kathy S. Miller's comment. Um, uh, that I think is really, is, is kind of right, that uh, she notes that many educators were practicing open, they just didn't realize it had been given that fancy name. I think that there's something that that's really true there, you know, the way that we kind of produce curriculum, share curriculum, um, and think of it often as, you know, a kind of the, the goal is education. So how do we how do we take what works and share it with others um, uh, versus, you know, th that, that's something that just is kind of baked into the way educators approach their work. Um, and so I do think that in some ways, a lot of this language of kind of disruption, of innovation, uh, is, is, is a kind of repackaging of an ethic that is kind of endemic to education. Um, and it, it's, it's, you know, sometimes I think that administrators just like discovered what it is that we already did and found a kind of different name for it. Um, I think there's, there's something there. Okay, so I want to uh, uh, tell you a bit about the, the kind of origins of this project. So in uh, the spring of 2003, we, 13, Joe and I were both teaching at community colleges in the greater Houston area. And we were kind of frustrated, frankly, with the extremely problematic cost of textbooks, uh, which at these institutions were our students were required to purchase them. Um, many of them couldn't afford them. Uh, in my classroom, you know, I would I was dealing with half of my students just didn't buy the book because, uh, frankly, they kind of couldn't. Um, so how do you how do you have a, a, a meaningful learning experience where right away um, you've got this kind of massive achievement gap uh, based on resources? Uh, also. So, you know, we were arrogant grad students and we also, you know, kind of just thought we could do a better job. Um, we've gotten a little bit more humble now on the issue of quality, uh, having, having uh, gotten in here. Uh, but the way that we started was recruited a advisory board of leading scholars in the field 
who recognized that there was a kind of need uh, for a open text in the field of U.S. history, um, and that uh, that that they kind of uh, understood this mission of uh, collaborating massively uh, uh, across the profession to try to take what historians know, uh, what is the work of research, and to make it kind of available to students. So that first step of recruiting this kind of fairly prestigious and fancy advisory board uh, gave us some credibility and allowed us to then recruit our contributors. Uh, and the way that this worked really was uh, kind of pretty basic. Um, I sent about 1,500 emails. Uh, it was a great distraction from the misery of writing my dissertation. Um, uh, you know, sending emails to historians whose work I, I had respected, uh, folks who had recently published books, uh, articles, or even advanced grad students at certain universities that had particular strengths. And we approached them uh, asking folks to write very short three to 500 word excerpts, um, really with the prompt of what is it that undergraduates absolutely need to know about your area of expertise? How can you give us uh, you know, a bit of that kind of granular dynamic detail that makes history come alive? Um, while also kind of giving us the kind of broad overview that students need to know. Um, so that was a kind of uh, the way that we kind of began this project. Now, you might be noticing the kind of curious title, right? The American Yop. Um, so textbooks in history often have, you know, some organize around themes. There's, you know, the American promise uh, or the story of American freedom. Um, others are kind of just gesture towards generality, America's history or the American people. In the lines of Walt Whitman, we found a as good an organizing principle as anything else, I think. Whitman wrote, I too am not a bit tamed. I too am untranslatable. I sound my barbaric yop over the roofs of the world. So long before Whitman and long after, Americans sing something collectively uh, uh, amid the deafening roar of their many individual voices. The yop offers uh, both the kind of chorus and the cacophony of the past. Uh, we try to keep an eye on politics and power, uh, incorporate transnational perspectives, integrate diverse voices, recover narratives of resistance, explore the complex process of cultural creation. We encouraged our contributors to look for America in sweltering slave cabins, in bustling markets, congested tenements, and in, of course, the marbled halls we all know. Uh, we want to navigate between maternity wards, prisons, streets, bars, boardrooms. Whitman's America, like ours, cut across the barriers that often kind of strangle our narratives. So that's obviously very romantic, kind of grandiose ambition. Um, we, we began with that kind of, you know, that kind of goal. But there is a very kind of practical thing here. Who's going to do the actual work uh, and what is it going to look like? So with that regard, we thought about some of this rhetoric that Joe just shared with y'all uh, about, you know, not just open source, but about a kind of spirit of, of collaboration. Um, so we wanted to think about how could historians collaborate in a new way to produce this kind of synthetic narrative of the American past. So if we think about how textbooks usually work, right, we've got uh, either a single author or a small team of authors uh, who kind of produced material, and then they send it out to content reviewers to kind of review the narrative that they've constructed. We, in a way, wanted to reverse this process. We wanted the textbook, the process, to start with the work of actual researchers. Let's, uh, you know, uh, hear from the folks that are in the archive that are doing the work um, um, at the kind of highest level of producing uh, uh, the first draft. So our first draft really was these series of small, brief uh, excerpts by content level specialists that then they filtered up to, to us uh, and we assembled a kind of internal editorial team uh, made up of contributors who were particularly skilled at writing for an undergraduate audience and frankly, who were you know skilled at being on time for stuff. That was a practical kind of concern. But this kind of grassroots up from the bottom uh, approach uh, is, is kind of how we got ourselves um, started. And this is what uh, ended up happening. Um, from those initial uh, um, requests, we got a little over 300 uh, contributors who agreed to write for us. From those contributors, we then recruited 26 chapter editors. Um, we had our two editorial boards that include 45 editorial advisors, 
These are the kind of, you know, leading lights, fancy, essentially famous historians that we were able to put on the masthead to give us some credibility. Uh, we also uh, looked at some of the kind of cutting edge thinkers in intersecting the digital world with history, um, these 33 digital content advisors. Uh, and then of course, Joe and I, um, I don't like saying up at the top, but whatever, that's, that, that's us up there. So um, this, is, this is kind of how we came about creating the textbook, uh, but then we wanted to take the process of collaboration even a step further. So to do that, we built, and I shouldn't even say we built, we plugged into, um, uh, a feature called Comment Press, uh, which is available for any website that runs on WordPress, which is what we did build the op on, by the way. Uh, and at the top of each of our chapters, if you actually pull up any of the chapters in the textbook, you'll see at the very top, it says that the American Yop is an evolving collaborative text, and we welcome feedback on our content. That brings uh, folks to a Comment Press website where scholars, even students, Sometimes the general public uh, chimes in and gives us paragraph by paragraph feedback. Um, we've had, uh, actually this, this last number, I think I had uh, 175, this is, this is out of date. I think now we're well over 230 uh, uh, folks have given us paragraph by paragraph feedback on our content. Uh, and every summer we get that feedback and we integrate it into a, uh, a, a next edition uh, that goes live in August. So it, it's maintaining this kind of spirit of openness, of collaboration, uh, to make sure that we stay current uh, with new research that comes out. And also, you know, yeah, that we're able to, to make sure that our text does reflect the way that scholars think about uh, American history. Okay, so this is how we started the project. Uh, the initial uh, uh, edition went live in the spring of 2014. Um, however, we still wanted the reliability that came with traditional peer review. We wanted the kind of institutional recognition, frankly, that comes with that as well. Um, so we eventually partnered with Stanford University Press, who gave us a traditional blind peer review um, and uh, formally published uh, an edition of the American Yop that came out in 2019. And they issued two print editions. Um, which are available uh, uh, for cost. Those aren't free, but they're low cost. Um, they're $25, but you can usually get your hands on a copy for as little as $16 or $17 uh, online. And we made these print edition available uh, because we noticed that some students would just print out the textbook. Um, even, even our younger students aren't all comfortable with reading on screens. Uh, there is a desire to have books in your hand. Um, and, uh, and we were fortunate in Stanford to find a partner um, who was willing uh, to, to make a print book for something that is still freely available online. Um, so that's how we began our partnership with Stanford. Now, kind of surprisingly since then, folks are buying the print copy. Um, so much so that we're on the verge of signing a new contract for a second edition with Stanford, one that is going to involve royalties that will come back to the project. And this question of royalties then begins this kind of more serious uh, process of us thinking about how do we think about questions of compensation and of labor uh, with this project. So I'll turn it back to Joe uh, to, to get us thinking about compensation in, in open educational resources. Yeah, and Ben, I'm going to condense here a little bit, maybe in the interest of time, so we have a little more room for a discussion. But yeah, so, uh, you know, we created this without any kind of financial support, any kind of institutional support. We were basically uh, last year grad school, first year in our uh, kind of academic jobs, and as Ben said, I think kind of trying to avoid our book projects and, you know, waiting for things to get back from editors and things like that. Um, yeah, we, we largely recruited, uh, you know, as Ben talked about, I, I say we, Ben spent, you know, hours uh, pouring through lists and recruiting uh, academics and uh, often many of them junior scholars. And we kind of put together this massive body of individuals. You know, I was really struck, yeah, uh, Kathy talking about that educators were already practicing kind of open uh, material. That is definitely the case. You know, all sorts of faculty members had uh, you know, their own web page, like faculty web pages with those really obscure university URLs. And we, what our goal was really like, let's bring all that together, right? No one person can write 300,000 words. No one person, uh, well, with, you know, and without these kind of structures. And so that was kind of our goal. Um, I, you know, we kind of, uh, one side, this is, we really were, um, 
enamored with this model, seeing it as a kind of this like really great attempt to work outside of these kind of systems and structures of academia. But then the other side, which you know we see more and more, is you know how like the is this an exploitative labor model that's really extracting considerable amounts of uncompensated labor from people, um, frankly, who aren't in positions to say no or are doing it under kind of uh, uh, pretenses that may not kind of work out in the current ag academic market. So we, we hit this um, question, right? Should OER labor be compensated? This wasn't really something we asked in 2013, but it's certainly one that we're kind of mulling over now. Um, you know, there's certainly the argument uh, in, in defense of, of kind of our model, right? Uh, this is uh, Stephen Harnard, who I think uh, is uh, among the more prominent for uh, kind of championing academics for getting out of this kind of like a copyright model of private research. He argued in what he called the subversive proposal that, you know, open access works because academics uh, have a salary. Um, and we're already engaged in all sorts of kind of uncompensated labor, right? Book reviews, manuscript reviews, when I publish an article, when, um, you know, uh, publish a research article, when you name it, all of the presenting at conferences here today, right? We're not receiving paychecks for this. Part of being an academic is, you know, we are receiving a salary often from public institutions. And it's kind of what we probably, you know, it's like our ethical imperative to share that knowledge as broadly as possible, certainly with our students. And then, you know, we're members of boards, you know, we give public lectures and things like this. That's kind of like our goal as academics. Um, OER works because, you know, if copyrights are designed to protect author profits, well, most of the time we're not really profiting off of those kinds of things, right? Uh, Martin Paul Eve is a big activist, uh, advocate of uh, these kind of policies in the humanities. He said, why should academics retain economic protections if they're not dependent upon the system of remuner remuneration that those systems are supposed to uphold? So I, I was certainly really... Um, you know, I was really proud of our model. I really like the idea of this kind of collaborative energy um, coming together. It, I was certainly stri stricken by this kind of turn of the millennium idea of, you know, the kind of like flattening of technology, right? All it really, you know, neither of us have huge technological proficiencies um, outside of like some very amateur understandings of like HTML, CSS, and I guess PHP. Like, it's a word press program uh, platform. It's a, you know, uh, Common Press was a plugin, right? And these kinds of things, as long as people were able to put the energy into it, it was really just kind of like a human resources question rather than a technological question. And we had this very clear problem that we wanted to answer. Um, but now, especially in 2022, uh, the question is really, do these kind of ideas still make sense uh, for uh, the academy of today? And I'll, I'll let Ben kind of take that up. So, so to be very kind of frank, uh, Joe is extremely proud of what we've done and think that thinks that it kind of speaks to a, um, a, 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 a an ethical advance in the field. And frankly, sometimes I feel kind of the opposite. To put it really frank, we asked a bunch of people to do work without pay. Um, most of them who, not most, but many of them who did that work uh, have since washed out of the profession. So I think it's it's important to, re to realize the kind of backdrop of where we are in higher ed today. Uh, I want to go back to a little bit of kind of some history here. Since the 1980s, public support for higher education as a percentage of state revenue has absolutely plummeted. Um, the, the way that we used to support education in this country, um, had, and even in states like Texas, uh, has declined precipitously. Um, so we're we're facing a kind of economic situation um, that that creates some serious kind of problems. We face that especially in the humanities, uh, where the the lessening resources that do exist are disproportionately being given towards the STEM fields. We see this being reflected in the way that people approach higher education. Um, STEM is, of course, all the rage, and the humanities is mocked and derided. We've got governors kind of, you know, um, saying that essentially it's not necessary. So we've got this, you know, major kind of public problem uh, that's also being manifested in a huge shrinking in faculties. If you look at who's doing the actual work, uh, particularly in humanities departments, it's it's uh, less and less and less uh, uh, faculty members who are being given salaries with the expectation of producing scholarship for others. Increasingly, it's adjuncts, contingent laborers, or graduate students um, who are being paid specifically for teaching classes, but are not being paid for producing scholarship uh, or for sharing scholarship. 
So we can have this kind of romantic idea of, you know, academics are supposed to give away their time and money, but in fields like history, where the number of actual full-time faculty uh, um, uh, is rapidly shrinking, um, if we start expecting folks to be essentially doing work for free, um, all we're doing is shifting uh, a model uh, that formerly exploited students and now is exploiting the producers of open educational resources. Of course, the way around this um, is in uh, targeting funding. Um, we mentioned the William and Flora Hubert Foundation, uh, who created the Open Textbook Initiative, put in uh, significant resources in supporting this materials. However, most of the, the money that exists uh, is there to organize, gather, uh, and make available open educational resources. It's less present to actually produce them. Um, so we had this massive project that involved 600 people. Um, uh, we did not get a grant from the Gates Foundation or from the, uh, you know, Hewlett Foundation. We are very grateful for support that we got uh, from OER Texas through the coordinating board. Um, that, of course, was really helpful as we produced some of our ancillary materials. Uh, but this grant, and frankly, any of the grants produced by organizations like this, uh, will never come anywhere. Well, I shouldn't say it will ever right now do not come anywhere close to actually funding the labor that is required uh, uh, to produce an open educational resource like the American Yob. So where do we go from here? What are we gonna do about this? Um, I think that there's a couple of models that are maybe worth considering. Uh, Contingent Magazine is a uh, historical resource published by uh, and for uh, folks that have uh, rigorous academic expertise in history, but are working outside of traditional tenure track jobs, specifically adjuncts, museum workers, independent scholars, all people who are credentialed as PhDs, but work outside of the tenure track professoriate, which is increasingly shrinking. Um, they compensate their authors through voluntary donations. So, We've got this kind of shifting understanding in academia in general. We see it particularly anecdotally among uh, folks in the humanities. When you ask folks to do something beyond teaching their classes, there is increasingly an expectation of some sort of stipend or financial remuneration that goes along with this. Now, I will note that ironically, I think that that culture of compensation um, might even reinforce some inequalities. The folks that are most likely to be offered that compensation are the very folks who are least likely to need it. Folks that have tenure track positions and are paid to give away their knowledge are the folks that are generally recruited for these stipend based uh, works. Whereas if uh, contingent faculty, graduate students or the like are asked to participate, it's usually under the kind of ruse of exposure experience, um, resume building, which really is, I just think, kind of fancy ways of justifying uh, uh, labor exploitation. So big picture, we believe that the American YAP does a social good. We think it is at the core of what the very mission of historians is. We want the world to come to a better understanding of the past, and we want uh, that knowledge to flow beyond uh, university gates, beyond paywalls, but we lack the resources to pay everybody involved. We hope that academics, particularly those whose salaries include expectations of sharing knowledge, will continue to write for the YAP. Uh, as an exciting way to shape understandings of histories uh, for the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of students uh, who read the text, or at least whose professors assign the text. That's a different conversation. Um, but for uh, graduate students, contingent faculty members, or for the skilled historians outside of the academy, we believe that compensation has to come with this kind of work. So, We've arranged this new contract with Stanford uh, that's going to give us about $10,000 a year uh, in royalty payments that will be reinvested in contributor stipends going to folks that work on this text. Is $10,000 a year enough for us to really maintain a rigorous hold on the discipline? I'm not so sure, but it's at least a start for us to, uh, to continue doing this work, continue trying to democratize knowledge in ways uh, that are more publicly available. So I'll, I'll acknowledge here 
that many of the problems that produce this kind of crisis uh, of compensation is what I'll call it. Uh, in truth, they're way beyond our scope. They're even beyond the scope of many of our university presidents. Uh, without increased public investment in higher education, there's only so much we can do. But we wanna do what we can, and we wanna do it in a way that is ethical, um, recognizing that merely shifting exploitation from one group to another, that is not progress. So we tried to give you a brief sense of where OER came from, some of the kind of romantic dreams that inform the movement, romantic dreams that maybe leads to labor processes that today can be exploitative, um, and then gesture towards a couple of ways that we want to move forward, uh, trying to both maintain um, some elements of the, the moral goal of the project without uh, slipping into what I, what I would kind of see as, as new uh, ways of, 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 of engaging in labor exploitation. So that's where we're at. We welcome uh, questions, comments, snide remarks, uh, whatever you've got. That's the end of uh, our kind of formal presentation. So thanks. Thank you all so much. That was so amazing. Um, I'm not sure we have any questions just of yet, but there is some good discussion going on in the chat. Does anybody want to unmute and ask a question? Feel free to do so. I, I will, if that's okay. And it, it, uh, this was incredible, actually. You kind of blew my mind. And in, in conjunction with um, the keynote that we heard from Jasmine Roberts Cruz, it was a, like a, a really interesting um, sort of move from what she was saying to what you've been saying. And I keep thinking about the two things can be true at the same time point that she made. And I, I hope you were both there and not sure that you were. But so in some ways, I, it's less a question that I love your perspective on, you know, the extent to which OER and open disrupts the systemic and structural ways that we do business or that we share knowledge, create knowledge, share knowledge, try to democratize knowledge. But then you hit the limitations and the problems, the exploitative nature of, of what you've been describing around the labor of producing the American YAP. And I hope some of that makes sense. And I'd love to hear your response. Of, it's, it's just this conundrum and how do you wrestle with it? There's a lot I think we could say. I'll start. Joe will definitely want to chime in here, though. But first of all, I'll say that the, this piece that we referenced in the American Historical Review, um, we kind of put this, we, we put a critical um, analysis of this idea of democratization in the digital humanities. This rhetoric is used a lot. Um, and we identified democratization is usually used in kind of three contexts. First, it's often used to talk about access just making stuff you know, more available. Uh, and in that regard, we would say that history has become open source. A lot of our materials is more available than it was before. Second form of democratization would be participation. Who are the folks that are actually allowed to produce this work? Now, in some level, I think that we democratize process pretty considerably. You know, Our text is not just written by three you know, Ivy League professors. Our text has been written uh, by folks who can who can at any point give us more feedback that we will seriously consider to kind of integrate. Now we're not fully, you know, um, um, open like a Wikipedia. We have an internal editorial structure that tries to maintain academic rigor um, um, in that way. But but we do think that there's a kind of more participatory issue. The third form of democratization is these questions about you know social justice. Uh, in what ways are our work? reifying or undercutting the inequalities that kind of, you know, uh, confront modern American life. And on one level, I think that, you know, when textbooks are $200 and uh, elite institutions rarely assign them, but community colleges do, we've got a situation where the students least capable of absorbing these high costs are being forced to do so. OER's ability to get around that is great. But we have these other questions of who's producing this work? In what way is it being compensated? And I even think about what are the democratized or the non-democratized ways in which this funding is organized. If we're at the behest of foundations, are we just really handing over control of higher ed to benevolent billionaires? Um, are, we, are we bypassing the kind of issues of faculty governance um, that I think should be a part of democratized scholarship? So in this regard, I think that you know the democrat democratization question uh, is one that I'm not optimistic about, and I'm fairly actually critical. Uh, and we talk about that more in that AHR article, which I probably stepped on everything Joe was going to say, but I'll give you a chance. Yeah, no, I was going to say. I mean, I, 
that that's great. I mean, that basically hits uh, <laughs> the three nails on the head. Um, I, I mean, I think, yeah, I, I mean, we certainly came out of this just OER is a tangible good, right? Students don't have to pay as much money. That's pretty clear. We've done a good thing. Uh, but then we start looking at these labor models. And, you know, I think I in particularly was really just struck by this idea of it's the institutions and the bureaucracies that have kind of like entrenched all of these problems. And the goal is to get around them. Well, getting around them means that we're engaging in this process where, you know, a junior scholar thinks that like we're, uh, you know, that this is going to make a different like, difference, like professionally for them, or they're engaged in labor that's not going to be seen on, uh, you know, tenure files or anything else. And it's just this kind of thing where, you know, it inevitably comes back to these institutions, like Ben was saying, you know, we inevitably have to go back to these foundations, we inevitably have to uh, depend on them. And, and when that comes back to the universities, you know, I mean, it, it seems like most of the participants in this conference, you know, in kind of library systems and things like this. So then we're throwing a bunch of labor on administrators, you know, here at my institution, where, you know, what I, you know, a, a third of our students are a Pell Grant recipients, um, you know, oh, let's do OER, it'll help our students. Um, hey, librarian that's already overworked and performing three jobs, get out there and start uh, figuring out how to spread OER here. And you just kind of get in this vicious cycle where there's no escape from it. And so, yeah, I think your description of this is just, it's kind of like a whack-a-mole. It's where do you want to put um, your kind of ethical energy making ethical sacrifices in other areas? Um, one more question in the chat was, how can we point our scholars toward the compensation um, opportunity? Specifically for the American YAP? Yeah, I mean, Ben, I will, we'll eventually be putting kind of calls out over the coming, maybe, I don't know, six to 12 months, because we're engaging in this uh, second edition rewrite that we're trying to kind of, you know, rebuild this project from the ground up. And uh, we'll be reaching out to um, institutions and uh, historians to kind of get participation. Yeah, and to answer this question of you know kind of where uh, where where should we look? Um, so first of all, timeline. We still haven't signed the contract. We're we're having to work out a few details. We're hoping it will be all nailed out uh, by you know the end of the fall semester. Um, we we always publicize through the American Historical Association's uh, uh, listserv. So if you're on that, I would I would encourage you to check that. Um, oh, okay. See, so for a librarian, yeah, this this is true. We we have no idea how to reach you people. Uh, you tell us uh, how should we be sharing it. We're pretty good at mobilizing the historical profession, um, but but that's that's where our networks lie. That's how we know how to communicate. I would actually welcome thoughts on how we should. How of we course, should. the practical answer is you can always just follow the Twitter account. <laughs> that's also true. <laughs> yeah. And then there was another one that we had um, that kind of was in the middle. Um, could income from low cost print sales provide sustainable financial support for stipends to remunerate um, contributors for these works? I mean, that was always kind of like the goal of a lot of these OER projects, right? There was always the question about whether that could actually work. And our, if I remember correctly, the first actual OER in history that was produced had to like get re-enclosed because it thought that model would work and it never worked. Um, the YAP has enough uh, use and we've been frankly shocked at the amount of people that do buy the physical copies that this is the kind of fun that Ben was talking about. Uh, as far as like sustainable financial support, I mean, th that's a question about what that term means. You know, if, if it was possible, we'd like to, you know, uh, reward much uh, in a much greater level. Uh, but I mean, the model can work. I mean, I think it's working for us, or at least it's kind of our uh, hope that it does. Um, yeah, and so I'm gonna answer this kind of in two ways. Is no way it will be sufficient to, to compensate every contributor. Mm -hmm. uh, the vast majority of contributors uh, we're hoping uh, we'll believe in the kind of the moral mission of what we're doing and we'll agree with our calculus that part of our salaries as tenure track professors comes with an expectation of doing, you know, research, teaching and service uh, that doesn't have direct external compensation. Um, if folks disagree with that, and if our culture of, of uh, uh, stipends has reached the point where folks are kind of no willing, no longer willing to volunteer their work in this way, uh, then it's then it's not going to be enough. Even if it is, uh, an, e even if though we do get a number of tenure, tenured folks to do it, 
The truth is that 70% of history PhDs right now do not get jobs in tenure track positions. These are folks who, uh, you know, have mastered their field. They've produced, you know, uh, uh, you know, the highest level of scholarship that is credentialed by universities. We want to keep them in the production of historical knowledge. If we're going to say things like, you know, the American YOP seeks to harness the expertise of the historical profession, 70% of that profession is going to be outside of these, um, these, these, uh, these, 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 these institutions. So we need to find ways to compensate them. How much are we going to be able to afford to do? That is still kind of a question. Uh, frankly, I think that a lot of these initial uh, stipends we're going to offer are going to be really small. Uh, it's going to be, you know, just, a, a, you know, between one and 250 bucks. Um, is that really a, a fair recognition for the labor of expertise that goes into producing a two to 300 word rough excerpt? I don't know, but it's, it's the best we can do, which is at least a step in that direction, I think. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cut us off there. I'm going to um, turn off the recording now, um, but if people want to continue uh, to chit chat, I'm happy to stay around for a minute.